This evening, we are very pleased to host Marcella Weiser and celebrate the publication of The Dawn of a Mindful Universe, a Manifesto for Humanity's Future. I could spend the entire hour listing his many accomplishments, but briefly. Uh, Dr. Weiser was born and educated in Brazil, traveling to King's College in London for his PhD. He is currently Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Dartmouth College, and in 2019, he was awarded the Templeton Prize for his work, quote, harnessing the power of the sciences to explore the deepest questions of the universe and humankind's place and purpose within it, end quote. The author of over 100 papers in peer-reviewed journals, magazines, and newspapers, he has also written or edited six popular science books in the U.S. that have been translated into 17 languages. His current research interests include the physics of the early universe, the nature of physical complexity, and questions related to the origin of life on Earth and elsewhere in the universe. And I must confess that I wasn't sure what an astronomer and physicist would include in a manifesto. And I am extremely moved, I was extremely moved and continue to be by how this new book, book spoke to so, so, so many of the issues that we face socially, environmentally, spiritually, and he does it all in really plain language. So please help me welcome mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I don't need that one. That'll be my third microphone. That will be oppressive, you know. Um, so, so happy to be back in Woodstock. Um, I don't think I've ever spoken at this place, but it's magnificent. It's really beautiful. So thank you for hosting me, and thank you for coming. Um, so, so this book is quite different from everything else I've done before, because you know, in my other books, I always mix science and religion and philosophy, asking questions about how science works and how it's, its relationship to religion. And I don't know if it's because I'm getting older and I'm seeing the kind of world that we live in that I'm getting more and more concerned with the future of our project of civilization. And I'm also sort of somewhat concerned about the fact that most of the stories that we hear about what's going to happen are very bad, right? It's mostly about a dystopian future, the end of humanity as we know it, you know? So there are many famous authors that talk about, yes, this is the end, we are selling our identity, we are polluting the planet, we are destroying the natural resources, and all of that is true. But what I found that is missing in this conversation is, okay, so what? So what do we do with that? Or why is this happening? And is there any way in which we can change this mindset and move the way we think about our planet and our relationship with the planet in a different way? So that's what moved me to write this book. And um, so what I do here is, in a sense, there are, three parts to this. The first one is the sort of more environmentally oriented part. The second one is a more astronomical part, situating our planet in the big universe. And what does that even mean? And the third part, of course, is the end of the book, which is a manifesto, which I'll, I'll talk about later on. So I'm gonna go and talk a little bit about each one of these, and then I'll read maybe a couple of pages from the book so you have a few, because speaking is very different from writing. And that is why humanists are very smart. You see, scientists, they always, they always speak without something written. They have maybe a PowerPoint and stuff. Humanists hardly ever do that. They prepare a written statement and they read it. So I asked, why do you do that? And they, the reason they do that is because we want to make sure that we touch on all the points that we want to make during my talk. And if I don't read it, I may forget this or that. So I'm not going to read the whole book for you, but I will hit on a couple of points that I hope will be important and complementary to what I have to say. OK, so the best way to start, I think, is to tell a little bit about the history of our species. So this book is about big ideas. you know, And um, big ideas in the sense of it's a macro view of our present situation. 
And so who are we, right? We, and I, when I talk about we, I mean we human beings, homo sapiens. So we've been here in this planet for about 300,000 years, give or take. We, we can't be precise about that, but that's sort of like the roundabout number. Now, of these 300,000 years, about 95% of that time, we, our ancestors, lived in a completely different way than we do now. Because that's 95% or even more of our history has been with pre-agrarian societies. So they lived as groups of hunter-gatherers, mostly in Africa in the beginning, until the big kind of migration started to happen out of Africa. And they organized themselves in, in smaller groups, and those groups helped each other. And now there's a lot of new anthropological evidence that the image that we have of those groups being very aggressive towards one another, never collaborating, always fighting and killing each other, it's sort of incorrect, that there was actually a lot of trade, there was a lot of connection, there was an interbreeding between these groups much more than we think there was. And, and the point is that to these people, the world was a sacred place. And this is true, this is still very much the same with most indigenous cultures around the world. And why was that? Well, because, you know, if you look at, okay, let's take a time machine and go back 30,000 years, okay? 30,000 years before science or anything like that. There are mammoths still around, right? and um, saber-toothed tigers. And they're also like, suddenly the clouds become dark and this lightning bolt hits a tree and, and makes it go on and uh, you know, burns it up like that. Or you have a volcanic eruption or you have earthquakes. There are these powers in nature which are way, way, way more above the control that we can, you know, that we can enforce with our little human hands and very primitive tools. And the fact is, we're still very much powerless when it comes to the big powers of nature. You know? Although the narrative that we have been constructing, which I'll talk about for the last uh, maybe a thousand years or so, has tried to convince us and maybe have, has convinced many of us to the opposite, that we can control nature that we are the owners of the planet, that we are the owners of all the animals that live here, that we actually own the land. So, which is a very interesting concept, you know, when you think of the past ancestors, you know, 95% of our history, we didn't own anything, we're just moving around, you know, the earth was the mother, right? And everything was based on a very close, familiar relationship where, you know, mountains are uncles and trees have spirits and so do fountains and, and waterfalls, etc. So there was no separation between the world of reality and the world of the spirits. Everything was animated. And I love the word animated because anima in Latin means soul. So something that is animated, something that is an animal, is animated by something which is not just material, according to the origin of this word, right? So the world was animated. The world was covered with, you know, surrounded part. Everything was spirits. And, and we worship, we, we meaning our ancestors, worship the land as a sign of respect, as a sign of fear, and, a, and an attempt to have some level of control over what was going on. If you can't control the volcano, at least you can dance and pray and make offerings to the god of the volcano to maybe, you know, the god will be nice to us and won't explode and burn our village down. So there was that kind of relationship with powers beyond us, which in a sense is more or less what science is doing. Science is a continuation of this conversation in a sense that we are always trying to deal with the mystery of the unknown. You know, science is a questioning of the things we don't know about the world, right? It's, I always say it's a flirt with the unknown, just to make it a little more interesting, especially to my students. Think science is just about data and numbers and equations? No, it's about what we don't know of existence. It's something much more profound and powerful and tempting, right? That we humans can actually kind of try to make sense of what's going on. 
Anyways, so we now fast forward to the beginning of the agrarian societies. And what happened was people realized very smartly that if you plant in a very fertile region, which in the case was, you know, where today is Iraq and nowadays is a complete desert because it was overused and pretty much destroyed. But at the time it was incredibly fertile. And that was very good because you could have much more food much faster than going after it. People congregated in these places. And as more people congregated in these places, you needed a more controlling hierarchy of power because, you know, you got to keep people in check. And somebody during this period decided that actually we can own pieces of land, right? So that, hey, this is my piece of land. And if you want something from here, we can trade. But if you invade it without my permission, that's trespassing and you can't do that because this is my piece of land. And I kept thinking to myself, you know, I live in the north of Hanover near Moose Mountain in this beautiful forest, right, with creeks, and I'm like, hey, this is my land. And then it dawned to me when I was writing this book, this is definitely not my land. I'm just borrowing this thing. I mean, I may be here for, what, 30, 40 years here? This thing has been here for billions of years, right? Well, maybe not billions because of the continent, but. Uh, hundreds of millions of years, and it's going to be here way beyond. So we don't own anything. We're just borrowing this. But we attach value and build a whole economical value system based on land ownership, which we are proud of and we work very hard to have if we can. But the point is that these are not the forces that rule nature. These are the forces that rule human society. You know? And nature is doing its own thing. And it has done its own thing way before we were here, right? So just to put things in perspective, we've been here, no, the planet has existed for about four and a half billion years. And we've been here 300,000 years. So if you compress four and a half billion years in 24 hours, we arrived about two seconds before midnight. <laughs> and we think the planet is ours. They're, they, you know, it's our thing that we can do as we want. And the success of our technological and economical growth, which was remarkable because we are, um, you know, there was this um, uh, Greek, uh, pre-Socratic Greek philosopher that said, man is the measure of all things. And, and, and that's not quite right, but we are definitely the things that can measure, you know. And, and the fact that we can measure, build tools, to kind of, you know, measure of the phenomena, quantify what's going on, create mathematical uh, equations that describe so much of the natural world did give us a huge amount of control over the way nature works to the point that come the 18th, 19th century, you have the 18th century, you have the Enlightenment, where the success of this mechanistic worldview that was developed by Newton and his followers was so astounding, really, that everything became ruled by mechanics. And if you look you know, at um, many of the American documents you know, in the, for independence, you see that in there. You, know, you see that language of force and power in the language of, you know, the, because that was where Ben Franklin and all these fellows were trained in this worldview, right? Anyways, so the point is that reason became the way to see things and the only way to the truth. There was a big conflict between science and religion, which is a completely other story that we can go on maybe when we have Q&A. But the point is that from a practical point of view, reason was the thing that dictated the development of society, right? Post-enlightenment and industrial revolution, which is the application of mechanics and thermodynamics to making machines that accelerated our growth. And then something very interesting happened because in order to have all that growth, you need to have fuel. And it's kind of a interesting barometer of what has happened to our society that in order to support the huge growth 
of industry and population that happened in this planet, we had to literally eat the entrails of the planet. You know, so all the oil, the gas, the coal, all this stuff is underground, right? And this underground energy that has been stored there for a huge amount of time due to leftover remains from animals that lived millions of years ago, that's where the oil and the coal and most of it comes from, kind of fed this incredible, powerful society that we built. And it worked beautifully until it doesn't anymore. And this is the time that it doesn't anymore. You know? And the question is, if we go this way, you know, we are choosing a path which is not sustainable. You know? And we need to change this mindset. And in this part of the conversation, which is sort of like the more you know, economical, industrial part of the conversation, the change of mindset comes from understanding that we are not above nature, we cannot control nature, science is never going to solve all our problems. To say that, hey, you know, we have global warming, all we need to do is build these machines that will sequester carbon and it's going to solve the problem, or we have 8 billion people now as opposed. So, an uh, interesting number that you guys may know this, but 100 years ago, there were 2 billion humans here. Now there are 8. In 100 years, we quadrupled the population of the planet. And that means more people need to eat, more people need energy, more people need all sorts of manufactured goods, and that accelerates economy, and that is good in some ways, but the environmental cost of that is devastating. You know? And that is the problem. So the change of mindset is to understand that this ownership idea that we have of the world is just wrong. And I was hoping that the pandemic would help us see that because it was clear during the pan pandemic, our fragility as a society. Now, here we are, the all-powerful humans, you know, that control the whole planet, and there comes this little virus and basically brings us to a halt for a long time, kills a huge amount of people, more than it should. And yes, science helped because, you know, the vaccines were a great success. It shortened the period of devastation. But the fact that there is a devastation is unavoidable. You know, so that should bring some level of humility to the way we think about who we are in the planet. But I'm not sure that has sunk in yet. So keep this in mind. And now I'm going to go to the other side of the story, which is the side of astronomy. What does astronomy have to do with this? Well, 1543, Copernicus dies. The day Copernicus dies is the day he receives a copy of his magnum opus, the book he worked all his life for, in which he says that, you know what, folks, this notion that the earth is the center of everything is wrong. It's the sun who is the center of everything. The earth is just a planet like all the other planets. Now, there was a profound, profound disruption of a way of thinking of thousands of years that was not just about, look, it's obvious. Look, you look up at the sky, everything is turning around us, right? The sun rises and sets, right? Everything is moving east to west. So obviously, we are the center. If I drop something, it's going to go down because this is the center. And, and of course, he had the courage to, to put this forward, right? He dedicated the book to the pope. So that means, you know, come on. At that time, the, the Catholic Church didn't have much trouble with that. That came after, thanks to Galileo and his arrogance. But also, he was right, you know, but that's another conversation also. But the point is, Copernicus moves Earth from the center. And what has happened ever since, due to the success of science and of astronomy, is that that previous centrality that we had is lost more and more. So then the sun was the center, but then we realized, no, the sun is not the center of anything. It's just a star, you know, like there are billions of stars. And then in the 20th century, people said, but wait, our galaxy is the only galaxy and is the center of everything. And then 
1924, Hubble says, sorry, no, there are hundreds of billions of galaxies out there. Ours is just one of them. They call them island universes, which is more beautiful than galaxy, I think. Um, and then also Hubble, five years later, says, and you know what? These galaxies are moving away from one another, so we're kind of losing our neighbors, so to speak, right? Because everybody, mostly everybody, is moving away. And then, furthermore, in, and this in the, next, uh, in the last few decades, we discovered that the stuff that we're made of, the atoms that we're made of, only comprise about 5% of what exists in the universe. Everything else is what we call dark matter and dark energy, which are names that we give to things we don't understand. We know what kind of they do, but we have no clue what they are, right? And I just wrote an op-ed to the New York Times like a week or two ago, in which I talk about this, our crisis of understanding in cosmology, you know, sort of like this Big Bang model, which is a beautiful, I spent almost most of my professional life working on this. And it's really, it's really um, a patchwork of ideas that misses a core fundamental principle that we don't have about the universe yet. You know, and so even the stuff we are made of is not important. So, you know, the whole nihilistic idea that, yes, we're nothing, we don't count for anything, became the prevalent astronomical view. On top of the fact that, wait a second, if there are 200 billion stars in this galaxy, and most stars we now know have planets, there are literally, literally, and this we know for a fact, trillions, that's a one with 12 zeros, of planets and moons out there. Just Jupiter has more than 70 moons. And what's remarkable is that each one of these worlds is different. There are no two planets that are the same. Anywhere, in the whole universe. And then you start to think, and that's, that's the post-Copernican disruptive view of my book, right? Uh, I insist in writing books which go counter-current and don't sell, but at least I'm honest to myself, you know, <laughs> and I'm happy about that. So the point is this. When you start to really look at the history of the universe, and astronomers say, look, it's huge, lots of worlds, the same laws of physics and chemistry, everywhere, and it's true, they are the same everywhere, and hence, using induction, if there is life here, there should be life all over the place, right? That's the idea. And then the biologists say, but wait a second, we don't really know how life emerged in this planet. One of the biggest mysteries in science, and it's a profound question, is how did inanimate matter become living matter about three and a half billion years ago in this planet. We don't know. We don't even know how to define life. So the way we treat life is you know what life does. Oh, it has metabolism, and we go very deep on that, and we know it reproduces itself, and there are different kinds of reproductive mechanisms. We're good at explaining all of that, but we don't know what life is. And the jump from non-living to living is a profound mystery. So somehow, three and a half billion years ago, a bunch of chemical, biochemical molecules like amino acids became proteins, found a little drop of fat which became a protocell. So uh, when you have, you know, a cell is basically a little thing that is um, how does, isolated from its environment. So the first cells, whatever they were, they had to do that. And it decided that it could metabolize energy from the environment and split. And those mechanisms, are, how do you do that? You know, and, and we really, really don't know, right? And there are lots of very smart people working on this stuff. And we cannot put the chemicals in the, in the lab in a Petri dish and say, hey, it's moving, it's alive, you know? And what is beautiful about life, if you start to think about it, is that life is matter with a purpose. What is the difference between a piece of rock and an amoeba? Is that a piece of rock stays there, and it's beauty, beautiful in its own way, but it's just a chunk of stuff that does not have any active intention or purpose to do anything. It just reacts to what's going on. 
Any living thing, any living thing has a purpose, which is to stay alive. And it will do so by looking for food from amoebas to giraffes to lobsters to people, right? And this idea that life is matter with purpose, it's very profound. And it's, again, how do you do that? How do you go from chemistry to biology, right? That's the, that's the point. And we don't know. And then we start to look at our neighbors, meaning planetary neighbors. And you say, wow, look at that. Mercury, it's just like the moon, only hot on one side and cold on the other side, because it's so close to the sun. Venus is a complete hell. It looks beautiful when you see it from here. But if you go there, it's 500 degrees on the surface. It rains sulfuric acid. And it smells like rotten eggs. Hell, isn't that hell? Sulfur, you know, hot kind of stuff. And, and Mars is this frigid desert that we had hoped to find life. And maybe there was possibly some kind of life uh, two billion years ago. And Mars had a thicker atmosphere and more water in its surface. But now, I'm really sorry. I really don't see it coming. And the other planets don't even have a surface because they're gas planets. So forget about them for supporting life. Um, and maybe some moons of the solar system are really fascinating. And I talk about all of them in the book. There is one, just very briefly, Europa, which is a, a moon of Jupiter, has a crust of ice, which is about a mile and a half thick. Underneath, it has an ocean, which has about, let me see if I remember, about 10 times more salt water than all the oceans of the Earth combined. And you say, whoa, you know, that could be it. And in fact, we have planned missions that go there and to another moon called Enceladus and to Titan, which is, has some kind of amazing uh, geological activity, but it's all with methane, liquid methane, because it's so cold there, but it has clouds, it has lakes, it has rivers, but of this other stuff. Anyway, so the more we look at the solar system, the more we realize that this planet is really magical. It is one planet that is a rare jewel. And then we started to look like since 1995, that was when the first exoplanet was discovered. What's an exoplanet? It's a planet going around other stars. And what we found was that now we have found about 5,600 5, other planets, other worlds going around other stars, which is a spectacular technological and scientific achievement. And we can now begin to look at their atmospheres as well. Because one way, you know, one of the beautiful things about astronomy is that you don't have to go all the way to a star which is 50 light years away from us. That would take us about, let's see, 100,000. It would take us about 5 million years to get to a star that far away with our fastest. So interstellar travel, sorry, Elon Musk, is not happening. You know, at least not happening soon enough for what we have to deal with right now, which is the pressing problems of our moment. And so the point is that we, have getting, we are getting information about these other solar systems. And we now can say that about 3% of those worlds, remember I said there were trillions, 3% kind of have the same properties of the Earth, meaning the mass and the radius of the Earth. But that has nothing to do with having life. Having life is a completely different story. Having complex life, we don't even know where to begin. Having intelligent complex life is even more mysterious because let me tell you this, if the asteroid that um, killed all the dinosaurs 66 million years ago didn't hit, we wouldn't be here. It's that simple. Life is really a product of cosmic and geological contingencies that no one has control over. And what life wants to do, as I mentioned, is eat and reproduce, wants to be well adapted to its environment. And there is no obvious plan that once you have life in the world, it's going to evolve to become a technological civilization. Right? That's a huge, huge jump in induction that you just cannot 
do, you cannot take that jump because we have zero metric. We don't know how to measure the probability of a planet having life. There's, we just don't know. There's only one point. There's no statistics. So our planet is really, really very special, right? And we humans, even though our animals are wonderful and my dog is a genius, <laughs> he, you know, he is not composing symphonies or writing poetry. Well, he couldn't with this ball, it would be very hard. But still, the point is, we are the storytellers. We are the animals that tell stories. And the biggest story we can tell is the story of our origins and how they are connected to the rest of the universe. And we are completely interconnected with the whole cosmic history. Each one of us carries within our bodies the universe. And I don't just say that in a lyrical, rhetorical way, which I do, but it's actually true scientifically. When you look at what are you made of? Well, down there you're made of carbon and you know, oxygen and hydrogen and calcium in your bones and iron in your blood. And where does this stuff come from? Where did all this chemistry appear? Well, this chemistry appeared because more than five billion years ago, stars exploded. And when a star, you know, star is the greatest alchemist, alchemist of the universe, because what it does is it gets the simplest chemical element that exists, which is hydrogen, it has one proton, and transform hydrogen into all the other chemical elements that exist in the universe. So, as, so all of this stuff is made in stars. Now, what happens when a star explodes and dies, because stars have life cycles, for example, our sun is going to live for about 10 billion years. It's about 5 billion years old, so it's, a half, it's a half its age. Eventually, it's going to become a red giant, but the point is all stars go through this life and that death cycle, and when they do, they spill out their stuff across the interstellar space. Those atoms are traveling, and I had a colleague at Dartmouth that is retired now that he used to make very patiently, basically, sequences of photographs of these clouds of hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen spreading out from exploding the stars that exploded millions of years ago. And what's going to happen is that these things are going to, it's just basically they're going to be the, the seeds for the chemistry of nascent stars and planets. So five billion years ago when our solar system started to form, it was seeded with all this leftover stuff from stars. And so all the chemistry that we carry right now, so you say, oh, I'm 64. Great, but I'm, my stuff here is billions of years old. We are literally connected to the rest of the universe. And this reminds me a lot of that wonderful Buddhist monk, you know, uh, 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 Nick Na. Thank you. Him? The Vietnamese. Who, Thank you, Thich Nhat Hanh, who came up with this concept called interbeing, which is a beautiful idea, right? So he says, take a piece of paper, and let's say you're reading a poem, and you look at the paper there, and you say, where did this paper come from? Well, from, from trees. Now, that tree, in order to grow, needed water, and needed sun, and the water came from the planet, and the sun is out there. And so without the sun, you couldn't be reading this paper, this poem. And without the sun, you know, where does the sun come from? Well, it's a star that was formed because other particles in the universe, you know, coalesced to become a sun. And those particles were made when the universe was very young. And so this piece of paper is connected to everything else that exists. And you cannot separate who you are from the totality of existence in the universe and I think that's just a beautiful idea that encapsulates what I'm trying to say. But now we are the ones that are telling this story, right? And the fact that we know this, that we know the preciousness of this planet, that we know that without us, the universe would not be able to tell a story. Oh, there could be other intelligences out there, maybe. 
but we don't know anything about them. We don't even know if they tell stories. We have zero idea of what the psychology of an intelligent alien, if it exists, is. What we know is this. You know, we know our story, the human story. And through us, the universe has found a voice. It took, let's see, it took about 8 billion years of, of cosmic evolution for our planet to come up with a species that is able to talk about what's going on, to ask questions about existence. Without us, the universe would have no voice. So we are the storytellers, the cosmic storytellers of the universe. And so when we think about us being nothing, no way. You know, without us, there would, be, there would not be the consciousness, the awareness of existence at all. So let me read a couple of things here from the very end of the book. Because I think it's time. I, I, OK. So I, I, the way I connect all these dots is by a concept that I call biocentrism. Because this has nothing to do with human exceptionalism, like we are the best. It's actually quite the opposite. It's like we have the moral imperative to understand our codependence with every living being in this planet. You know? And it's not about human exceptionalism. It's about human humility to kind of understand how we need one another. No bees, no food. It's that simple, you know? So here it goes. A universe without life is a dead universe. A universe without minds has no memory. A universe without memory has no history. The dawn of humanity marked the dawn of a mindful universe. A universe that after 3.8 billion years of quiet expansion found a voice to tell its story. Before life existed, the universe was confined to physics and chemistry, stars forging chemical elements within their entrails and spreading them across space. There was no purpose to any of this, no grand plan of creation. Through the unfolding of time, matter interacted with itself as gravity sculpted galaxies and their stars. The emergence of life on Earth changed everything. Living matter doesn't simply undergo passive transformation. Life is animated matter, matter with purpose, the purpose of surviving. Life is a blending of elements that manifest as purpose. This sense of purpose, this autonomous drive to survive, is what define li defines life at its most generous. And in our general, and in our world, the mountains, rivers, oceans, and air sustain every living being. Life elsewhere may be very different from life here, but if it exists, it must share the same urge to survive, to perpetuate itself in deep communion with its environment. The alternative, of course, is extinction. When life exists, it will struggle to remain existing. Life is matter with intentionality. Um, the more we look to other worlds in search of signs of life, the more we realize how rare Earth is, how rare life is, how rare we are. We are the cosmic voice capable of telling the cosmic story, and we need to rise above our destructive urges and our greed for immediate gratification to reorient our future. The story we have been telling until now, the Copernican narrative that we don't matter in the big schemes of things, the Earth is just a planet among trillions of others, is simply wrong. We matter because we are the only life form that knows what it means to matter. We matter because we, know, we now understand how we are evolutionarily connected to every other life form on this planet, descendant as we were from the same bacterial ancestor. So the, according to modern biology, you know, our ancestor was a single-celled organism that lived three billion years ago. And from there, every living thing came. So that's pretty powerful. Talk about interconnection of all life forms. We matter because we know that life here is contingent on the whole cosmic history, from the properties of subatomic particles to the expansion of the universe. We matter because we are how the universe ponders its own existence. We matter because the universe exists through our minds. So, 
let me read this paragraph too, and then I'll talk for two minutes about the manifesto. This is our collective story, the story of a species that has learned to fashion raw materials into tools of exploration and objects of beauty, that has developed the ability to speak and tell stories about the experience of being alive, stories of love and loss, of war and heroic deeds, of triumphs and failures. The challenges we now face, products of our inability to build a sustainable relationship with the natural environment that supports us, that is so wrong. Just think about that for a second. We face together as a single species, as the human tribe. That is another point, uh, uh, aspect of the book that I really mentioned, is this notion of tribalism and the good and evil of it. And that perhaps the best way for us to move forward is to recognize that above and, f and, and any other kind of tribal differences, we are a human tribe. We are the, the species, Homo sapiens, in a single planet, you know, and that is essential. There is profound unity in that. We fell into the hole we dug, but we can crawl out of it if we are awakened to our cosmic role. If we truly matter, we should not erase our own legacy. We must reconnect, reconnect to this planet and to all life on it with the humility and respect of the worshiper and not with the sword and rage of the slayer. This is the moral imperative of our age. So then I go to the so-called manifesto. And what I did is I went back to my teenage years and I read the communist manifesto because how do you write a manifesto? You know, it's like a word that is abused a little, right? So a manifesto I've, I relearned has two parts. It has a part where you make up your point. You know, what is your argument for change, right? It's because a manifesto is a call for transformation, right? And, and then so you say, it has to be different because of these problems. In the case of Marx and Engels, it was the bourgeoisie and, you know, workers of the world unite and you know the story. In this case, it's about the unsustainability of our current course, you know, of, of civilization and what needs to be done in order to change the way things are going because they are not going to get any better. You know, global warming, if you don't see global warming happening, you don't, it's the same as looking at the mirror and say you're not aging, you know, I mean, come on. So, I mean, there is so much compelling evidence for it. It's just obvious. Um, anyways, so the second part of the manifesto is action items. You know, okay, so what do you do, right? And in case of the Communist Manifesto, it's like, let's get rid of the bourgeoisie by doing this, this, and that. This is not the kind of revolution I'm proposing here. The revolution I'm proposing here is a revolution of our current mindset. How do we change the way we think about who we are and how we act in the world in order to change our relationship to the planet? And so I... I ex first I construct the argument and then I have a few action items. What do you do, right? From the individual level to the corporate level, you know? And there are things that are changing now. You know, there is this whole big movement in corporations now which are called B Corps, you know, B Corporations, which are essential corporations that understand that in order to become, sus become sustainable and, and be long ranging, meaning having more than five years of existence, you need to change the way you relate to the planet and its resources. You need to change the way you relate to your clients. They are not your targets. You know, they are your, your uh, partners, right? So the consumers are not targets, they are partners. You don't have an ad campaign like a general has a military campaign, you know. You have a conversation and you listen to the people that are buying your product. Because the alternative is very simple. If people begin to understand that they have power as individuals to like not choose to buy from companies that do not align with their values and the way we live our lives, you know, this is also part of this conversation. The way you choose to live your life reflects your values, you know, in many, many ways and including the way you relate to the planet and to life on the planet. So, People say, but this is really too big for an individual. You know, it's the problem of the government. It's really the problem of the big, big money corporations. And that is just wrong. It really starts with the individual. 
you know, I mean, we, you know, the consumers have much more power than we think we do. Because if you stop buying from a company, the shareholders are going to say, okay, they're not buying our products. Why? Well, because we are not aligning with this more alternative way of thinking about the world, you know. Well, let's change the way it goes. Let's change the ethos. And a lot of companies have been realigning themselves precisely because of that. So there is some change going on. There's also the young generation, you know, and, and I have younger kids. And so I'm also worried about the world they're going to live in. And I have been teaching at Dartmouth for over 30 years, and I have witnessed the huge increase in emotional fragility of our students, you know. So it's hard, it's hard. Anyways, so here it is, actually, this one. This chapter on the manifesto has a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, like the epigraph is from him. So it's, it's, it's right there. Okay, I'm not going to read any of this, but I am going to give you a few of the parts of the manifesto, just to give you a flavor. So the number one, the core value of biocentrism is that a planet that holds life is sacred, deserving of respect and veneration. We are part of the life collective, codependent and co-evolving with the whole of the biosphere. So in the book, I make the case that we should resacralize nature. That what has happened, you know, when I started this whole conversation about our ancestors and so many indigenous cultures that believe that the world is sacred, something happened with agrarian civilization, which is also where monotheistic faiths came about, where the gods left the earth and went up to the, to the heavens. And in many faiths, you know, uh, and in, in fact, there is this wonderful uh, ordained Christian uh, Catholic priest called Thomas Berry. I don't know if you ever read him or heard of him, but if you have not, do me a favor and read Thomas Berry because he's a very profound thinker, way ahead of his time. And uh, he, has, he has a book called The Dream of the Earth, which is a beautiful book. But anyways, he um, is basically saying, it is strange that in a religion where God is everywhere in principle, you know, or religions, that we detached the sacredness of the planet and of life on the planet to look at a much more abstract concept of the divine, you know, which is not here. So the point is that the earth becomes unprotected from its divinity, becomes objectified, and it's much easier to abuse an object than to abuse something which is divine. So we need to resacralize the natural environment. And does, that does not mean necessarily attached to any um, organized religion. It's just really the notion of the sacred does not need to be attached to any religion. It could, and it is, obviously. But it's really about the understanding of the value and the awe that we feel when we are in communion with the natural world. And you all live around here. You know what I'm talking about, right? So there is something deeper than us that we feel when we are connected to nature. And we have to rescue that feeling, that sort of natural spirituality, in order to reconnect deeply you know, with our planet. And here it's easy, but you go to Chicago or you go to Sao Paulo. I was in Sao Paulo two, week, two days ago. And you know, that place is, is scary. And of course, I'm from Rio. I always say that about Sao Paulo. But, <laughs> but it, you know, because Rio and Sao Paulo, like, like in Italy, is Rome and Milan, and Brazil is Rio and Sao Paulo. It's like, um, because in Rio, nature is everywhere, the mountains, the ocean. Even though it's a big city, you, you can't escape it. In Sao Paulo, you just don't see it. You just see it's literally an ocean of buildings that go all the way to the horizon. It is unbelievable, right? And then I'm like, what have we done? That was what I was thinking. How did we do this? Because if we think about the city, the city is the anti-nature. It's like you push nature out and you build this concrete artificial thing full of right angles. There are no right angles on nature. 
you know, there are no perfect circles on nature. But we made this stuff. Actually, this is pretty neat because I have to say, there are a few. <laughs> but this is the exception. Uh, maybe, you know, the older architects are smarter than we are. But the point is that we created an artificial environment to be, and that's hurting people. You know, there's a lot of um, new research on this and forest bathing and how your physiological rhythms and metabolic rates change when you are more exposed to natural, to nature in general. But anyway, so the point is that I make here is essentially that there are several steps that we can take. I'm not going to read any of them, but um, I can do one just to give you a feeling of what's going on. Um, when I talk about each individual has a role to play, and, and this role involves sacrifices that are entirely distinct from those of a bloody revolution. Instead of paying with our lives, we celebrate and preserve life and align our values and actions according to three principles. The less approach to sustainability, I have to explain what that means, the more approach to engagement with the natural world, and the mindful approach to consumerism. So the less approach to sustainability is individuals should critically examine what they eat, how they use energy and water, how much garbage they produce, and how, how they dispose of it. The approach should be focused on less. Less meat, don't need to go vegan, but just not, let's see, we eat by seven times three, 21 meals a week, right? You can do it five meals with meat, you know? You don't have to ban meat, but we don't have to be that. Anyways, less meat, less energy, less water, less garbage. And then I explained the more, and I explained the mindful approach to consumerism, which was the one where I mentioned that uh, we have a role to play as consumers too, to choose to align with companies that actually reflect our value system. You know? Either way, if you don't believe in this, then you, you know, fill up with ExxonMobil. You know, if you do, you try to find a company which is less, or you buy an electric car if you can. That's it, folks. So these are the main, main ideas of, of the book. Um, of course, you can't really do a lot of justice in whatever, an hour. But um, I hope you think deeply about what I'm saying, and hopefully we'll have more time to talk at some point. Thank you. So that's, that's wonderful because, um, yes, there is nature you know, in the cities. And I actually say something like, in the more approach to engage with the natural world, I say, whenever possible, individuals should engage more with nature. If forests and natural parks, ocean, mountains, and trails are not available, then take walks on waterfronts, explore city squares and parks, and plant gardens at home. And then schools and families can take children on hikes and excursions into the woods and organize visits to positive examples of environmentally mindful farming and industrial park practices. Such initiatives will greatly help change the overall mindset that nature is expendable. The approach should focus on more. More awareness of the life around us, big and small, more gratitude for the planet that allows us to be alive and flourish, and more kindness to all forms of life. Very Buddhist. Obviously, there is some influence, as you can tell. Um, but absolutely, you know, there is always a way of finding nature somewhere. And uh, it's just that, um, and to, to most people, you know, they, they don't even do that, which is kind of sad. You know, you go to the big cities, and I've lived in a big city a lot. Um, people just forget, you know, they forget to look at a cloud or the sky. Um, I, was, I was in Italy some time ago, and we, we were in Tuscany looking at a pretty big telescope with a bunch of friends, and, and one of them said to me, you know, I never ever look up, you know, and look, I'm like, really? I mean, what are you doing? That's where, you, that's your home, <laughs> you know, but, but the point is that that is the reality. So, yeah, Sao Paulo has one fairly big park, which is Ibirapuera Park. And whenever I go there, I always ask to stay in a hotel right in front of it so I can go running in the trails there. You know? but, um, but the point is, there is always a place to look if you have the mindset to search for it. That's, that's what's hard to change. Yeah, we can do the calculation. But the point is, yes, I mean, 
it is really not about where you live, it's how you live and, and the way you relate to the planet. You know? And you can be living in the city, you can be living here or even farther out. Uh, it's, it's, it's really the way you relate to the planet. And if you're even thinking about using less light, less water, less energy, always counts, you know? And I think that's really a, a, a mindset that people can have, you know, or change. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's a complicated question because a lot of that came because of us. Right? I mean, so we are sort of the perpetrators of this ecological imbalance. And, uh, and then we try to fix things, right? And then we try to interfere by, let's cut these trees, and then something else happens, and you have like some blight or something. So um, every time we interfere with nature, even if the intention is good, there may be a backlash. And, 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 and the problem with life is that it's not like mechanics, you know, it's not like calculating the orbit of, of Saturn around the Sun, which is a very clear mathematical problem. Life is really unpredictable. And because it's, a, it's, it's not a, a system that you can, I know the state of the system now, and I can predict how it's going to be in the future. You just can't do that, you know, with life. And so that is the problem. So you have now with global traveling, of course, you're carrying seeds all over the place and you have invasive in boats and, you know, but so yeah, it's a problem. But I don't know exactly what to say there. I mean, what, the only thing we can say is obey some of the laws. They say, so if you have a boat, they always say, scrub your boat when you go from one place to another, right? And how many people do that, you know? And so you have the algae from one place going to another. So it's really, again, it's a huge problem. And honestly, if we don't change sort of a, the problem with, with, with environmental issues and global warming is that there is no obvious enemy because the enemy is ourselves. You know, it's not like the Russians are coming, you know? Okay, let's, or the Nazis are coming, let's build a bomb like Oppenheimer, right? You may have seen the movie. It's, it's more complicated. And the other part is that you don't feel it immediately. It's not like a bomb explodes. It's, oh, the hurricane. Well, but there has been hurricanes before. How do you know that this hurricane is coming from global warming? Well, there are answers to that, and one of them is the amount of, it's not the number of hurricanes, it's the power of each one of them that has to do with the amount of moisture in the atmosphere that comes. So, but the point is, it's very hard to not pay attention to the signs by kind of saying things, you know. And people even say the earth is flat, right? And then, and then they say, oh, good, so look at uh, the moon and all the other planets. Are they also flat, you know? So how come the Earth will be flat? So if you make a picture of the solar system with all the planets, have like all the balls, and then have this flat thing, people will believe amazing things you know, because of tribal issues and wanting to belong to a way of thinking. And anyways, yeah, thanks for a point. Yes, ma'am. Is human nature changing? You're asking me if human nature is changing? Yeah. So I think we are changing, and, and, and not necessarily for the better. I think we are changing because the biggest change between us and Homer and is, is technology and the way we connect with technology in our lives, right? And right now, if I ask you guys to pick up your cell phones and turn them on, turn them on you can all do that and be okay. And I say, okay, now switch with the person next to you. And they're going to go, whoa, you know, no thanks, I won't do that. And why not, right? Because the phone is really part of who you are. It's like, and, and you, you can do an experiment right now. You can pick up your cell phones and you can look at the apps. And yeah, everybody's going to have, I don't know, let's see, given the age, your Facebook and not TikTok, but you're going to have Facebook and you're going to have certain apps apps that we all share, but then you're going to have something about Buddhist meditation, I'm going to have something about running, and basically we each are going to personalize our applica uh, application for uh, choices because 
those machines are really now an extension of your being. And so much so that you forget it, maybe there are exceptions here, but if you forget it and you go out and you're like, damn, I forgot my cell phone and I'm now 20 miles away, I don't have time because I have a meeting, so I'm gonna spend the whole day, you're gonna feel really bad, disconnected, <laughs> anxious, why? 20 years ago, we couldn't care less. We didn't even know this thing, and we're all fine. But now it's a necessary thing. So that is changing because what we, the phones are doing, not just the phones, but the technology and digital, is that it's kind of expanding our reach and our, our boundaries. So you, which is amazing, if I told my, my Russian grandfather, actually Ukrainian grandfather, I actually can talk to my relatives in Ukraine and look at them in real time, he would like sorcery, right? <laughs> no way, how is that possible? And which is remarkable, but that makes us closer but also pushes us apart because there is no such connection like we are having right now. I mean, I could be in a Zoom screen here and I guarantee it would not be the same. You know, and as a teacher, I see this all the time. And during the pandemic, we had to do these online classes. And there's nothing better than being together because we humans are social animals. You know, we need to be together. And those technologies are changing that. You know, and they're and they're exposing young people to a lot of very aggressive behavior. And I could go on and on. So. If there is a change in human nature that is being prompted by that, 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 that's not necessarily a very good one. You know, there are great aspects to it, obviously, no question about it. But um, so my hope is that the change in human nature is going to come from this new awareness that we're going to develop slowly. It's going to be painful, I think, in the next decades. I think there's going to be a lot of complications, lots of complications will emerge because of mass migrations from coastal areas, etc. before people really wake up to what's going on and, and really understand that we need to change things at a huge level, not the cutting edge, you know, activists and people that already understand that, but the other 7.9 billion people in the planet, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so that's, a, that's an interesting point. I never really thought of it that way. Um, but um, the thing about cosmology, you know, as opposed to other sciences, is that we are inside the universe. It's not like a biochemical reaction that I can put in the lab. You know, I can go to the lab and I can mix stuff up or we have our... And I have this friend, uh, Peter Tse, who is a neuroscientist at Dartmouth, who does these amazing experiments with the intelligence of octopus. You know? So the octopus is in there, and you, know, you can actually experiment and, and figure things out. But we are inside the universe, and we are, we are sort of like a fish inside a bowl, a fish bowl, trying to understand all the oceans. Um, and, and that means that we can't. And, and so we extrapolate and we make stories about what is possible beyond our reach, right? And yeah, those stories do uh, reflect our value system because every story reflects your value system. You know, every, the way you tell a story tells a lot about who you are, you know, because we can tell the same story and we're going to tell it differently because you are you and I am I, you know, and, and, and it's just a different, we're just different even though we're so similar in so many ways, right? And so the thing about the universe, if it's really true that we are the storytellers of the cosmos, then the way we tell the story of the universe really is the way we are telling our own story. And so you really can't, again, Thich Nhat Hanh, you can't, really can't separate the two because they are one, right? And so I think that we are evolving as humans to tell a better and better story of, of the universe and of ourselves in this universe. And the hope is, is a story that we don't know the end or where it's going to go, right? And, and we're sort of at a 
crossroads right now. And we, make, we have to make choices about how is this story going to go, you know? And is it just going to keep going the way we are? And are we going to just trust technology to solve all our problems? Even being a scientist, I think that's a very dangerous idea. I think technology helps a lot, but also technology, we have to be honest about it, serves the money. Science is paid by governments that are funding military research and huge corporations that are funding scientific research. So science is not pure. So this notion that science is disengaged from the political process or the economical process is just false. I mean, you saw that in Oppenheimer, right? I mean, the guys developed the bomb and then they had the thing that could destroy so many people and they realized they lost total power to decide how it had to be used. Because they said, why, why do you have to drop it on people? Just explode a small island in the Pacific to show the power of the thing. And the argument was, oh, the emperor of Japan would never surrender. How do you know if you don't do it? They didn't try. They just did it. And then they did another one a few days later. How come? Well, there were two different kinds of bombs. They wanted to test technology. And the argument is, the Soviets were coming down Manchuria to take care of the Pacific, and they wanted to make sure that, hey, don't mess with us, because if you made one, we made two, we can make more, sort of like. So the story is, every story that we tell is really a mirror of who we are, right? It doesn't matter if it's in a canvas or if it's the universe, it's really about us. And the story we are telling about who we are right now, it needs to be changed. You know, this narrative needs to change. And yes, it can't be just about science. It has to be about every human endeavor that tries to understand the meaning of who we are. Arts, philosophy, the, all these messages are fundamental. We need, some of you may have gone to some of these events I did at Dartmouth when I had the institute there of bringing science and, and humanities together. Well, why I was doing that? Because I realized that the big questions that we are facing cannot be answered just through scientific or humanistic approaches. We need all those voices, to put it more lyrically. We're drinking a glass of wine, right? And you go, oh, I'm a biochemist. Look at that. The wine is coming from the fermentation of the grapes. And you, know, and you have this sugar that goes into alcohol. And then the crystal physicists look, oh, look, the light is diffracting through here. It's just a gorgeous thing because of the crystalline structure of the glass, etc. And then, um, let's see, the agronomists will talk about how those grapes came to be because without them, there'll be no wine. And then there's also the side of, but who are you having the wine with? <laughs> and to appreciate that glass of wine, you need all of these elements, some more than others, but all of them tell the same story together. And you just enrich the story that we tell as humans by putting all these aspects together, right? And so we need all, we need them all. And so I, I agree with you, and that's exactly how we should be telling our story, you know, with all these different elements of what it means to be human. Yeah, no, that's a wonderful reflection. So the mindful in the title has two, two, two functions. One of them is the dawn of the mindful universe really means our minds in the universe makes the universe, as you said, you know, have a mind. So that's the idea. And us being mindful of how we live our lives is also part of that idea. Um, but it's, it's funny you mention this because there's a school of philosophy called panpsychism, which is panpsychism, which is becoming very popular now, where it says that mind is pervasive across the universe and it is as fundamental as mass and electric charge. It's just a quantity that exists, a thing that exists. And that what life does is that it becomes kind of a, an antenna for that. So that a small, simpler 
organism has a smaller antenna, and <clears throat> more complex organisms have bigger antennas, and can capture more of this so-called mind of the universe. And um, yeah, there is, uh, there is quite a lot of people, actually, surprisingly, a huge number of people, actually, in philosophy mostly, and obviously religion, because this sounds a lot like Spinoza, you know, from, which was Einstein's inspiration for the idea that the universe has some sort of primal intelligence that, that is before anything, right? So you can call that God if you want. And if that idea is true, I don't know. That's why I'm an agnostic. I'm not an atheist. I'm an agnostic. I don't know. I, I just keep my mind very open and I, I respect the possibilities of what we don't know. It's called epistemic humility. And, but if indeed there is something out there that is beyond us, then yes, we can be just this puff that in this 13 billion years of existence, this mushroom emerged in this little planet, did all these amazing things, and maybe there'll be other mushrooms emerging in other places in the universe doing their things, and they're just part of this cosmic existence. You know, it's a mind with different voices that we don't know about. But honestly, I think that's wonderful and very poetic and kind of awesome. And I didn't mention mushrooms on, it wasn't an accident that I mentioned that when I mentioned it, made this. But the point is, I find this kind of, given the problems that we have right now, I find this sort of dangerous because it's a little dispersive of focus. You know, say, oh, you know, it's just the cycle of, and I talk a lot in this book about the notion from Greek uh, philosophy of, the flow of matter in the cosmos, you know, creating things and dissolution and creation and dissolution. Many, many philosophers, just like in Hinduism, you have that in philosophy, in Greek pre-Socratic philosophy, you have that too. I find that a little dangerous because by, by, by this creation and dissolution of stuff, we pay less attention to us. It's almost like the Copernican problem, you know, like, hey, it's just one mushroom, you know, there are many out there, who cares about this one? But we have to care about this one because this is the only one we know exists. And that's essential. And we are not, sorry folks, even though all the UFO stuff out there, we are not going to have contact with extraterrestrial civilizations. You know, I have a very well distinguished colleague from Harvard that I think went non linear writing papers about interstellar visitations in this planet and books and whatever, you know, I'm sort of like shocked. Uh, I've known this person for like many decades. Um, anyway, so the point is that we don't know and maybe the yes, but this maybe yes is not as important as the work we need to do right now.